Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and also for uh, having all this energy to organize these online seminars uh, in the last few years, especially during uh, the, the first year of COVID. This seminar has helped me like immensely to, to stay in contact uh, with, with the math community. So it has been super helpful and I, I hope it continues. Um, okay, so today I would like to talk about the second moment method for irrational points. So this is a method that people in analysis or analytic number theory have been using almost for, I don't know, like 20 centuries, if, if we can say this. Uh, but in the last two or three years, uh, people who do geometry and rational points, they use it more and more. Uh, and it's almost like a small industry now. So, so I thought I would give some kind of introductory talk uh, around these topics. Okay, so uh, let me, okay, it works, right? I'm in the next page. Yeah. Okay, so um, one important question in rational points is Hilbert's 10th problem. So this question broadly says, give me any polynomial equation with integer coefficients and say I want to solve it in the integers or in the rationals. Is there a finite time algorithm to solve it? Uh, and this was asked famously by Hilbert in 1900 and Matyasevich in 1970s, building on the work of many, many others. Uh, amazing, he proved um, that there are some strange equations where there is no finite time algorithm. And if you've seen these equations and you are an analytic number theorist, uh, what you could think is these equations maybe are not so typical. These counter examples, I mean, they require like half a page to write and, and maybe they are a bit complicated. Um, so yeah, you could ask what happens if I pick like a totally random, like a typical Diophantine equation, uh, is there a finite time algorithm? So that's the main question I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so here is one of the very central conjectures in my area. It's by Jean-Louis Coyotelen, and it says the following. If you give me some equation which defines some kind of variety over the rationals, and if there is simple, if the geometry is simple, so the so professionally we say smooth, projective, and rationally connected, then there, there should be a finite time algorithm. Why? Uh, so there is a Brouwer, there is the Brouwer group. This is a finite group you can uh, calculate for every D of and equation. And just by looking at this group, whether it's um, trivial or not, you can decide if you believe the conjecture, you can decide whether the Hasse principle holds. Uh, and the Hasse principle also is a finite time algorithm. Why? Because if you have a smooth equation, then you only have to check solubility at a finite list of primes. And for every prime, there is a finite time algorithm, basically Hensel's, uh, Hensel's lifting. Uh, so for every prime, there's a finite time algorithm to check if there is a, a, a piadic solution. Okay, so today, I'm going to start by giving a few examples. And then I'm going to um, mention very philosophically what is the second moment for rational points. And in the last uh, section, I'm going to go into a bit more details about one specific infinite family of equations. Uh, so these are called satellite surfaces. And together with Tim Browning and uh, Yoni Teravainen, we proved that 100% of these equations, of these satellite surfaces, they satisfy the Hasse principle. Okay, uh, so if you, if you don't come from analytic number theory, one question you could ask is, what exactly is a typical Diophantine equation? Like, how do you define this thing? And well, uh, like if, if you ask somebody who is in the first year, what probably they would tell you is, okay, you take, all cubic equations or all quadratic equations in, I don't know, like 20 variables. And you make a list, you let all the coefficients to go from one up to a million. 
So all the coefficients go from one up to a million. And then you check if every, if every one of these equations um, has a solution and if it, if it is everywhere locally soluble. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say, the obvious way to define typical is to order these uh, polynomial equations by the size of the coefficients. This is the most natural way to do that. Um, so one example uh, in, I, I guess, 2014, so Manzul Bhargava proved that if you take a cubic equation in three variables, homogeneous, uh, then there are 10 coefficients. Okay, so if you let these 10 coefficients to live to vary in a big interval, so from minus a billion up to plus a billion, uh, and you let the length of the interval go to infinity, then positive percentage of these equations will satisfy the Hasse principle. And interestingly, he proved that the positive percentage will also fail the Hasse principle. Uh, and yeah, so the technology he used is a lot, it was building on a lot of the things he was doing uh, before about averages of cell meringues. So, you know, these questions, even like for some cubic equations, like in three variables, these questions are not so trivial uh, as you might think when you first see them. Okay, so one very, very recent result from a couple of years ago. Uh, so Goss and Sarnak, they proved that the Hasse principle holds for 100% of these cubic surfaces. These are cubic affine surfaces. Uh, so the equation is, uh, an integer is equal to a sum of three squares minus the product uh, of these variables. Uh, and these are very difficult. You cannot deal with them with uh, like, I don't know, like the circle method because the number of variables is very, very small. And uh, they used uh, a lot of ideas from um, cohen lenstra the, the circle of cohen lenstra heuristics, like averages of class numbers of quadratic fields, uh, to prove uh, that the Hasse principle holds for 100% of coefficients k. So you let k be in a big interval, a random integer, and then you check local to global principle. Okay, uh, so another example more related to what I'm going to talk about today is that uh, together with Alexis Korobogatov in 2020, we proved that the Hasse principle holds for satellite surfaces with positive percentage. I'm going to define satellite surfaces a bit later, but let me just say for a moment, uh, another result um, that I, I really, really like, uh, it was published, I believe last year in the annals. Um, so it's by Tim Browning, Pierre Leboutek and Bill Savin. So they proved that some very difficult varieties in very small number of variables satisfy the, uh, the Hasse principle with probability 100%. So one of these examples, are homogeneous equations uh, in degree four and in five variables. Or uh, in degree homogeneous equations in degree five and six variables. So these are like really difficult. I mean, this, for the circle method to work, you need at least, at the very, very least, the number of variables to be two times the degree. Uh, and yeah, so this result is uh, proving a conjecture of uh, Bjorn Pune, actually. Um, okay, so, so let me uh, try to give a well-defined question. So what are we trying to do here? Uh, we fix an infinite family of equations and, um, and, and we want to follow the, the conjecture by Coyote, by Coyote Len. And so what, uh, what we will do is we fix an infinite family of projective rationally connected varieties with rational coefficients. Uh, and then we assume that the Brouwer group uh, is trivial, the generic Brouwer group, because you could just take one equation, for example, uh, which, um, for which the Hasse principle is not satisfied. There are some counter examples. Uh, and then just take some infinite twist of this equation. Uh, but then the generic Brouwer group, uh, it will not be trivial. So, so first we clear out any possible algebraic abstractions and then we order 
the size of these integer coefficients of these equations, we order them um, uh, by absolute value. And then the main question is, does the Hasse principle hold for typical uh, varieties in this infinite family? Okay, that's philosophically the, the main question. Okay, so what is the second moment? Uh, I mean, for the Hasse principle, the first example I could find, possibly there is a, an older example, is in the 1920s. So Hardy and Lithgood, they used the GRH to show that uh, the Goldbach conjecture holds for 100% of even numbers. So they proved uh, that if you, if you look at a random uh, even number between one and X, then there is 100% probability that it is a sum of two primes. In my mind, it is a Hasse principle question. Mm, although you, you can argue about this. Um, okay, so, so what, is the, what are the philosophical steps for, for this second moment method for proving existence? Okay, so let's say you fix a subset of Zn and then you're asking, is some polynomial equation soluble in this subset? So you, you want to solve this polynomial equation where every Xi is in this subset. Maybe it's the primes or maybe it is the cubes or I, I don't know, it could be anything. Okay, so, so the first thing you have to do is you try to make a conjecture for the counting for the number of these solutions. Okay, so uh, you're asking how many integer vectors are solutions to this uh, fixed polynomial equation. And then typically the answer will be some function of X like X or X over log X or some or X square, um, some simple function. And then you have to multiply by a product by an Euler product of some periodic densities. Um, I mean, yeah, if the family is difficult, it's not so easy to make, uh, to try and predict a conjecture, but sometimes you can just um, work on the major, uh, let the minor arcs be zero, just equate them equal to zero, and then see what the major arcs give you. This is, this is what uh, Hardy Lithgood always did. Um, okay, and then the main object in the second moment method is the following expression. So you sum, over the integer polynomials f whose size of the coefficients goes up to h, okay? h will go to infinity, it's the main parameter. Okay, and for every such po uh, polynomial f, you're adding a square of something. Basically you're adding uh, the square of the error term. Um, so this is just the number of solutions minus the conjectured value from the previous step. Okay, and the, the substantial step in this method uh, is to prove that on average, this thing inside the square is smaller than g of x squared. Okay, so by much smaller, I mean little low. Uh, and, and why is this useful? Because typically for a random polynomial, this, this product of periodic densities, it, it tends to behave like a constant on, on average. Okay, uh, and then, so from Chebyshev's inequality, you can show just by using um, the, the statement that the number of solutions will be lower bounded by this Euler product times G of X. And the last step, which is very easy in more analytic problems, but becomes harder and hard, harder when you go to geometric problems. The, the last problem is to show that if, if your uh, polynomial F is, has periodic solutions, then this periodic fa factor CP is positive. And actually you have to prove uh, that this product is not close to zero as a function of, of X. Okay, so, uh, and if you do these three steps, then the conclusion is that for 100% of polynomial F in your favorite family, if there are periodic solutions, then there are integer solutions. Okay, so, so let me just give you one very simple example of this second moment uh, method. Okay, so, so let's recall what is Sintzel's hypothesis. 
I'm only going to state the very old version already known by Bunyakovsky. So it states that if you give me an irreducible polynomial in one variable uh, with positive leading coefficient, you assume there is no periodic obstruction. So in particular, you assume that there's no fixed prime divisor. The conclusion is that it represents infinitely many primes. Equivalently, it represents at least one prime, okay? As, as in many problems in analytic number theory, infinitely many is equivalent to just existence. Okay, so uh, this is a very hard problem. Uh, it's only one case that is known when you have one polynomial of degree one. And this is the Rishles theorem in progressions. Uh, and here, what is the second moment expression you, you would like to work on? Well, you average over indices of polynomials of prefixed degree let's say degree 10, and you are looking at all irreducible polynomials of degree 10, and all the coefficients go up to eight, and then you add the error term. Now, luckily this error term, is, you don't have to make a conjecture. This is the Bateman-Horn um, conjecture. This is the error term in the Bateman-Horn uh, question. Uh, so we know what is these periodic factors are. Uh, I've, I have included infinity here because C infinity is one over D. Um, Okay, and then together with Alexei Skorbogatov in Imperial uh, College London, we proved that on average, this error term has a logarithmic saving. Uh, when the counting parameter X uh, goes up to a fixed power of log of H. Uh, and and this, this is already enough if you only care about existence. So as uh, if, if you follow the previous steps in the previous slide, you can prove already that uh, ha, the single hypothesis in my mind has the principle holds for this problem for 100% of polynomials. Okay, and using uh, ideas of Coyote Len from the 70s, uh, you can prove directly results from this corollary. Uh, results about the Ophandin equations. So one very, very simple example is, let's say you're looking at this equation. A sum of two squares is equal to a polynomial. This is the simplest example of a satellite equation. You want to solve it uh, for with, in, with an integer t. Okay, and directly from this corollary and using um, like ideas of Sansouk, Sunerton Dyer, and Coyote Len, uh, we, we proved that the Hasse principle holds with positive probability for this surface. The problem is um, there is always some loss of information when you're just using simply primes, uh, prime problems to, um, like to solve Hasse principle problems. Um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this a bit later. So le let me just very briefly talk about the idea of the proof. So let's say you only want to do the first moment. Uh, we, we, should, we shouldn't go into a, a lot of details. So you're averaging over all integer polynomials of fixed degree D, and then you're just adding the counting function uh, of the number of prime values for the polynomial. So we freeze the value of the polynomial P of N. Uh, what it means is that we're summing over all integers that could assume the value of p of n. And then stupidly, we then add the indicator function that of the event that this integer k is equal to the value of the polynomial. Okay, uh, and, and then what we do is we use the standard circle method identity to detect the, whether an integer is equal to zero. And if you do a few steps, a few uh, simple manipulations, you, you get an integral of uh, basically the unit circle of some exponential sums. Uh, now these are very easy exponential sums because um, the coefficients, they vary in an interval. So this will give you linear exponential sums. It will give you, to be precise, it will give you the Dirichlet kernel. And uh, the primes will be separated from the polynomials. That's why you do the circle math. And, um, what will be left of the primes will be the classical Vinogradov exponential sum. So you're just summing an exponential where the argument k is just a prime in a big interval. 
Okay, and roughly what goes on, uh, if, if alpha is very close to irrational, then uh, you just use siegel wolfitz theorems to control the sum. And if alpha is not close to the irrational, uh, already just, just the estimates by, Vinogra by Vinogradov are, are okay for this problem. You, you, can, you can upper bound uh, the sum. Um, okay. And then we had this, we uploaded this paper and after a few months, there was this online um, meeting in Mita Glefler and there were a lot of talented PhD students there. It was a good place for me to feel very old. Um, okay, so, so there, there was an open problem session and I, I asked a little problem. Uh, I asked, can we prove better error terms and better results? if we don't care about the primes, if we only want to control the Moebius function. So here, um, uh, there's the big conjecture called the Tsaula conjecture. And uh, it says that if, if the polynomial PN is not a constant times a square of a polynomial, then the Moebius evaluated at this polynomial should take random values one or minus one. Uh, so, I mean, this, this sum should be a little low of X. Okay, and then Jonita Ravainen, um, he came on very quickly with a very general method, which applies not just to Moebius, not just to primes, but to any function that has some general properties. Um, okay, so what are the properties? Assume you have a function defined on the integers that has zero average in arithmetic progressions and in short intervals. I will explain in a few minutes what exactly that means. But, but let's, let's, let's just leave it at that for now. Then fix any number D. This will be the degree of the random polynomial. Then for 100% of degree D integer polynomials, this sum, uh, one over X uh, times the average of F over the polynomial value, this sum, converges to zero. Uh, so yeah, so in particular, you, you could say that Tsaula conjecture holds on average for generic, for, for typical polynomials. Now this theorem, the assumptions and the conclusions are not well defined at all. So, so let me just tell you what they really mean. So the assumptions, uh, so the, the, the actual thing in the theorem says that uh, there exists uh, some two constants, A and delta, such that for every moduli going up to a power of X, so this is much stronger than single wall pitch. Um, you want the function to have zero average when you look at the progression, but even when you have small intervals. So the interval should go from X up to X plus a small power of X, specifically one minus Delta. And okay, so X to the one minus Delta is just the length. Q is the number of uh, terms, one over Q normalized by one over Q. Um, and so you, you're asking that your function F has zero average in this very strong sense. And you want to get a logarithmic saving. Now you are only asking it for almost all Q. And by almost all Q, I am excluding basically Ziegel zeros. Uh, so this kind of assumption is difficult to prove, uh, but it is doable using uh, Huxley zero density theorems and, and other like deep ideas. Um, so for so it is difficult to verify this assumption, but it, it it can be it can be done in some cases. Okay, and then what is the actual conclusion? Well, if you take x, the length of the sum, to be a small power of h, namely one over two times the degree, then the second moment of these sums will have zero average, so you'll get a logarithmic saving. Okay, uh, so so let me give you. Uh, few comments. Uh, actually, this, this theorem, if you look at the paper, is not there because we, we had the more general version where you don't have to 
randomize every coefficient. You can fix almost every coefficient except two coefficients, like what you would do, let's say, in Barban, Davenport, Halberstam theorems. Uh, so we have a more general version of this. Um, and of course, you can ask, like, why do we have short intervals? Like, where, where does it come from? Uh, and the reason is, uh, it, it, it's very simple, actually. Let's say you're looking at a degree D polynomial, a random degree D polynomial. Let's say you write the value P of n is equal to a, a random coefficient CD times n to the D and so on, plus a constant coefficient C0, okay? And now let's say you freeze, you fix the values for the input n, the integer n, and you freeze every uh, coefficient except C0, except the constant coefficient, okay? And now, uh, you're taking random values for C0 from one up to eight, like random index values. Then what happens to this integer, P of n? Um, so it moves around some fixed integer, which is of course this fixed number. It's the part of the polynomial uh, that has no, that, that doesn't have C0. Uh, and the interval around the center has size eight, because of course, that's the size of C0, that's the typical size of C0. And now if X is like a power of eight, then this becomes a very short interval. So the length is much smaller than the center. Um, okay, and then you could, uh, you, you could also ask, why do we care about arithmetic progressions? I mean, with the previous approach, with the circuit method approach, they naturally come up when you look at the major arts, but here they naturally come up in another way. So when you actually do this, the second moment, uh, you will have a system of two polynomial equations. And now let's say you fix n, m for two integers, two different integers, n and m. And you also fix every coefficient except the constant and C1. And now, so now everything is fixed except C0 and C1. These are like the two, vari the two variables uh, that are between minus eight and eight. Okay, then the, these two numbers, if you take the difference, they are the same modulo n minus m. This is trivial because, I mean, yes, um, C0 will vanish and then you have a multiple of n minus m. And so n minus m will be the moduli of a congruence in a, in a very, uh, in, in a sum of length, basically a power of x. So you're, you're starting to fall into the dangerous zone of uh, bombieri Vinogrado. Um, okay, and if you actually follow the previous circle method approach I had with Alexei Skorbogatov, uh, you would only be able to do that with X to be a, a logarithmic power of eight. So uh, one of the improvements um, is, is that we prove these prime number conjectures and the Tsaula conjecture on average, but the size of the, of the sums has, is much bigger. Okay, so uh, let me be more precise. Uh, one of the theorems we have, oh, sorry. Is somebody speaking? No, okay. Um, all right, so, so uh, let me give the actual theorem for the Moebius function. So you fix a, a number, an integer d, and then you, you're looking at a random integer coefficients, of, uh, uh, random integer polynomials of fixed degree d. And you're letting uh, all d plus one coefficients uh, be between minus eight and plus eight. Then this estimate here, uh, which, which proves the Tauler conjecture, it holds when X goes up to a somewhat large power of eight. Uh, and, and as you can, as you know, maybe from other second moment problems, on GRHs, you cannot improve much. I mean, if you use GRHs, you just um, increase the value of X just a little bit by a fixed constant. So you, you will be able to go up to eight to the one over D. Okay, and, and this was the question that I had in mind. 
uh, when I asked Yoni Tervainen ab about this problem. And soon after this, Tim Browning uh, from uh, IST in, in, in Vienna, uh, he joined the project because uh, he found a way to apply this general tool about like general functions with zero average. He found a way to apply this to the Hasse, to Hasse principle problems. Okay, and now there is a lot of notation. I have to define what are these the often the equations, uh, the the satellite equations. Uh, okay, so uh, fix any number field k and denote its degree k over k. Let's denote it by e and uh, de denote the ring of indices as usual by OK. All right, and then we denote by n k over q the, the, the norm of the, of the number field. OK, now you fix any integral basis of the number of the ring of indices. It doesn't matter which, uh, omega 1 up to omega e. If you don't like any of this, just think that k is the is q adjoint i, q adjoint the square root of minus 1, and then just take omega 1 to be 1 and omega 2 to be square root of minus 1. Um, it's, it's the same proof and the same ideas throughout. OK, and then uh, the norm form is, is defined in the following way. You take the norm of uh, z1 omega 1 plus z e uh, omega e, you just, you just define it to be the norm of this element. Um, OK, so I mean, this, this generalizes the, um, the, the, the norm z1 square plus z2 square, which is what you get when you start from the um, uh, q adjoint square root minus. OK, and what people call satellite equation is the following thing. You take a norm in variables. Uh, so this, is, this will be an indexer polynomial like z1 square plus z2 square. It will have degree e, and it will have the number of variables here will be e. So the variables are z1 up to z e. These are integer variables. And this is equal to uh, an integer polynomial. That, that's what people call the satellite equation. OK, so if k uh, is a quadratic number field, then this is z1 square minus a constant z2 square is equal to a polynomial. and and this is basically an infinite family of conics. And geometers call these, uh, th this professionally called a, a conic bundle surface. Um, OK, and there is quite a lot of work uh, done in the 80s about the Hasse principle for these equations. The reason is the first uh, nice counterexamples for the Hasse principle um, were done, uh, were made for equations of this kind. Uh, it was by Skowski in the 70s, and his counterexample was a sum of two squares is equal to a quadratic polynomial times another quadratic polynomial. There are some of these polynomials uh, that uh, don't satisfy the Hasse principle. And Manin, in, the, in his ICM talk in the 1970s, he tried to give an algebraic explanation by he invented this Brouwer Manin abstraction, and then he never worked on it again. And the, the subject was uh, took uh, was taken up by Coyotelen and Har sorry, this is a typo by Harari and Skorobogatov, and they proved a lot of results. Um, yeah, so so this satellite equation is important because it's an basically you have a surface that you can break in an infinite family of curves. And usually for these curves, you can prove the Hasse principle. So this is an effort to prove the Hasse principle basically by induction on the number of variables. That's why people in geometry, they care about conic bundles and these satellite equations. Um, but, but still many things are basically open. OK, so one of, of the important examples is the following. If you start with a cyclic number field extension, and if you give me an irreducible polynomial, so forget these weird counterexamples of the Hasse principle, just take irreducible p, then 
Uh, it was proved by Koyotelen Harari and Skorbogatov that there is no Brouwer Marine abstraction for rational points. What it means is that the alge algebra predicts the Hasse principle should always hold for this equation if you have a nice number field and then irreducibly polynomial. Okay, so uh, le let's, let's talk about a few of these results. There are actually quite a lot of results, so I'm only gonna focus on the irreducible polynomial equations. So the Hasse principle um, has been known to hold uh, in, in the following cases. Actually, that's another type. I should have said the Brouwer group controls the Hasse principle in the following cases. Uh, so it's, it's when you have a quadratic norm is equal to a low degree polynomial. So the polynomial must have a degree only up to four. And, and this was a gigantic effort using a lot of algebraic methods in, in some papers in Krelle in the 80s. Actually, it's two papers, and it was by Coyote Lenz and Suk and Sunit and Dyer. Mm. OK, so you can ask, what happens if you have other norms coming from like cubic or quartic number fields? Uh, and uh, Salberger and Coyotelen, again in the, in the 80s, they proved that if you have a cubic norm and an irreducible cubic polynomial, then uh, the Brown group controls the Hasse principle. Uh, yeah, and then if you just ask what happens if we have completely general norms, then the, the Hasse principle is controlled by the Brouwer group only if the degree of the polynomial goes up to two. So you see, the, the, these questions are difficult uh, and you cannot have any degree. Somehow the, it becomes much, much harder when the degree becomes bigger. Uh, and, and this result, uh, it was proved in a paper by Browning and Heath Brown in, in GAFA. And then a few years later by algebraic methods, it was proved again by Derenthal, Smith and Way. Okay, uh, and there's a very general result. It was proved in 94 by Coyote and Schultz and Tyre. This is basically one of the guiding results in this area. It assumes a heavy conjecture. It assumes Sintzel's hypothesis and it shows that uh, all satellite equations satisfy the Hasse principle um, if there is no Brouwer obstruction. Uh, for all number fields and all polynomials, actually no, not just irreducible. Um, yeah, okay, so, so let me just give you the last result uh, from, from this paper with Tim Browning and Yori Teravainen. It says the following, uh, fix any number field, and fixed uh, a positive integer D. This will be the degree of a random integer polynomial. Then you look at the uh, random satellite equation, and then basically we prove the Hasse principle for 100% of these equations. Okay, to be more precise, uh, ordering polynomials of degree D by size of the coefficients, and only looking, only focusing on, on polynomials with positive leading coefficient, the satellite equation from the previous slide satisfies the integral as a principle. Okay, so th there are a few comments here. All the previous results I talked about are about the Hasse principle for rational points. Uh, in this paper, we, we proved uh, things about the, the integral Hasse principle. And this is, a bit more recent area, uh, what is the Brouwer group for the integral Hasse principle, for example? This is not so old. And Coyote Lane with his collaborators um, has studied this. And so for example, he has shown that if you pick a completely random polynomial, then this satellite equation should have void Brouwer abstraction if you're asking for integral Hasse principle. And Actually, it is a bit more subtle. So uh, Jennifer Berg, she had a, a very interesting result. She proved that there are some simple equations. A sum of two squares is equal to some degree four polynomial. 
uh, there are some simple equations like in low degree where the integral has a principle fails, but also the Brouwer abstraction does not explain this. So yeah, so, so you cannot really expect to have 100% Hatsa principle for all equations. And somehow restricting on positive leading coefficient, it, it kills all these problems um, that uh, Jennifer Berg uh, proved. Uh, so here are counter examples they had to do a little bit about solubility in the real numbers. Uh, okay, and the, actually I should have mentioned uh, there are a few results. Uh, so uh, there are papers by Mitankin which prove that if you assume that uh, the Sintel hypothesis, then you can prove some version of as a principle for integer points as well. And there are other papers, uh, but in general, the integral has a principle is not so well studied, I would say. Um, and as always, okay, you can always complain. Uh, we only look at random polynomial equation. We don't prove anything for any given equation. Um, but the advantage is that there's nothing known for these equations for, uh, for irreducible polynomials when the degree is like six or seven or anything bigger than that. Okay, uh, so let me talk a bit in the remaining, I guess, 10 minutes. Uh, let me talk a bit about the proof in the paper with Tim Browning and, and Yoni Teravainen. All right, so the, uh, the idea is to uh, try and prove a second moment estimate uh, try to use the second moment method directly um, to the counting function for integer solutions. You should not be going through prime numbers uh, as I did in my previous paper with Alexis Krobogatov. Okay, so uh, let, let's define uh, the main arithmetic function. So yeah, again, if you don't like the notation, just think of this function R of N it is counting the number of representations that you can write n as a sum of two squares. Uh, but if you have a general number field, you define it as the number of integer solutions to this equation. The norm is equal to n. And for to, to make things simple, we restrict the summation into a box just to avoid cusps because yeah, counting is a bit awkward in, in cusps. Okay, and the main sum we want to study is the following. You want to sum this R function at the value of a polynomial P of N, and you average over all integers N going up to X. So if you want to prove that P of N has an integer solution that is equal to a norm of this number field, all you want to prove is that this sum is positive this CP of X. Um, all right, and we will prove slightly a, a, a bit more. We will prove that it goes to infinity polynomially fast. Uh, this is important if you, if you want to prove like stronger statements than existence of solutions. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in the paper, we actually don't just prove the Hasse principle, we prove some kind of Zariski density results. So we prove that 100% of these satellite equations satisfy a weak form of the risky density. This is slightly bit more than as a principle and weak approximation. Okay, the, there is one little problem. Okay, you want to use this previous tool um, about like functions with zero average, but I mean, these functions here, these are functions, they have positive average. So it's, it's not obvious how to, to use them. Well, you have to use a model. You have to use a function. Uh, let's call it R hat. A function, another function R hat that has the same average like R. Even when you look in small intervals and in um, arithmetic progressions. Uh, and it turns out that there is 
there are many people in analytic number theory who have worked on these kind of ideas. So there is the Kramer Granville model. So basically what it does, maybe you know you maybe you've seen it if if you've studied the Kramer model for the primes. If you give me any multiplicative function, I, I can try to replace it by looking at what happens at the small prime powers. All right, so, so to be more precise, I will define R hat of n to be a function gamma that takes into account periodic solutions and, and some real density, some function omega that has to do with uh, real density. Okay, so how is gamma defined? Uh, so here we do the W, the W trick. Um, so we will look at this polynomial equation, norm is equal to a number n, modulo W, and we will count solutions. And what is W? It is the product of all primes up to something that goes to infinity pretty fast, this exponential of square root log x. And you also have to allow the exponents to go to infinity. Uh, so a bit like log log x. So if you do the primes, the exponents are always one. If you do the, the old Kramer model. But if you want to prove Hasse principle theorems, you have to allow the exponents to go to infinity. This is so you can cut solutions coming from maybe like modulo p square, because Hensel, maybe you start lifting solutions from p cubed or p to the four. Um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about the omega function. It's, it's a, an integral analog, a real analog of, of this gamma. This, this gamma is a, a local counting function. Okay. So let's see how one can use this tool for these, uh, from the previous slides. This, this tool I, I talked about before about functions with zero average. Okay, so you can, you can show that the average of R hat is equal to the average of R by using some, some machinery from Dedekind zeta function. I mean, already for the sum of two squares, I guess there is very old work by Selberg and Hulley, which gives a positive level of distribution. Um, and if you want to work for completely general number fields, there are a lot of algebraic issues. And, and luckily, Tim, he had a paper with Heath Brown um, where they proved the Hasse principle for some satellite equations uh, for all norms. So, so we, could, we could use some of this machinery. OK, so if you use all of that, then, then what you get is that this uh, Granville Kramer model, R hat minus the function Rn, it will have zero average, uh, e even on progressions and in small intervals. Okay, what, what does it actually mean for us? So it means that this second moment will be small. So what is this moment? You're summing over all degree d polynomials whose coefficients go up to eight, and you have the square of Cp minus C hat P. So what is C hat P is, is defined like CP of X, but you just replace R by R hat. So this is, what is this sum? You're summing this uh, fake approximation R hat at a polynomial value when N goes from one up to X. It is a bit like summing the Kramer model uh, for like, if you're trying to, to start to, to make a um, uh, Bateman-Horn prediction using the Kramer model, you would have some kind of sum like that. Okay, so for our theorem, it suffices to, to prove a lower bound for this average of the R hat function. And, and so the, the goal for the remaining of the talk is to give an indication how you can prove that for 100% of um, admissible polynomials. So these are polynomials uh, such that the equation, they, they have an equation with uh, periodic solutions for every prime p. So you have to prove that for 100% of these integer polynomials, 
the satellite equation will be such that this sum will be growing like a function of x. It's a bit like x over some powers of log. Um, okay, and so what is nice about this, this r hat function is that it, it has to do with things that happen locally. So things that happen modulo some w, modulo some small number w. So you can study its average, its average even over polynomial values in the same way that you would use Rosary Vanitz sieve um, to, to, to work with the Kramer model over polynomial values. So this, this step is not very difficult. You can prove that if the polynomial P uh, is everywhere locally soluble, then this sum CPX will be lower bounded by a nice constant times X. And this constant, it could be zero if there are no periodic solutions. How, how is it defined? Um, it is defined by looking at the density of solutions of the original satellite equation modulo W. So you're looking at all vectors, uh, Z1, ZD, and T modulo of this, this number W that goes to infinity with X. And you want to prove that uh, the, this is, bounded away from zero. So by ranking streak, you can, you can do the following thing. You want to bound the probability that this density of solution is close to zero. So how would you do that? Well, the number of degree D polynomials modulo W uh, such that this periodic density is say like something like one over log X by ranking streak, you can upper bound it by one over a power of log X. And then for every polynomial modulo W, so you have D plus one elements modulo W and you form this polynomial P of T, for every such polynomial, you're adding one over this density. Of course, this density, it could be zero. There are no periodic solutions, but you only do it for everywhere locally soluble polynomials and it's, it's easy to prove that this density is, is non-zero. Okay. So now the goal is to try and bound this weird expression. I mean, in some areas, uh, in analytic number theory, you are averaging singular series and you're averaging, it's, it's not uh, uncommon to see these kind of expressions, averages of periodic densities. Uh, however, in these areas, you're averaging the density itself. So you would, you would sum sigma, not one over sigma. Um, so th this is a bit unusual. Okay, so, so in any case, uh, you can prove, uh, you, you can try to, to give some kind of Hensel argument, some kind of Hensel lift argument, and you can prove that this one over sigma will be large, but only when, it's, um, it's fir the first solutions modulo primes come from very high exponents. Um, and this is, this is reasonable to expect. If there are no solutions modulo P, no solutions modulo P squared, no solutions modulo P cubed, but the first solutions you can lift come from modulo P to the 10, then this sigma will be small. And that's, and you can prove that uh, it's if and only if. Okay, and this will mean in, in particular that the polynomial P of T in its derivative will have a common root modulo a large power of the prime P. And the last tool we use is the Igusa zeta function. So if you have a random polynomial uh, with D plus one coefficients, uh, then you can look at the discriminant. Now this is a fixed polynomial, right? So if you randomize the polynomial, the discriminant is fixed. It's not random anymore uh, because it's variables are the coefficients of the random polynomial. So you can use estimates about solutions of polynomial congruencies if you just apply them not to the random polynomial, but the, the discriminant of P, okay? And uh, this discriminant of P is a polynomial 
in the coefficients of p that is in general very complicated. And there's not much you can do. So you have to use some general theory which tells you that if you give me any integer polynomial in any number of variables, homogeneous or not, or irreducible or not, or whatever, then the number of solutions modulo high prime powers is not so big. And this comes basically, it's very easy. It comes from the first pole of the Igusa zeta function. And actually in the paper, we use some explicit version of this result um, from a, a, pa a paper of Lillian Pierce uh, and Damari Sindler, I think. Um, yeah, and, and then this means that this blue sum, it will be kind of not, it will not explode. It will have a very small value because one over sigma will be big only when the discriminant has a lot of polynomial solutions, modulo high prime powers. And, and therefore, this means that this probability, the probability of these densities to be small, this probability will be close uh, to zero. So this, this proves uh, the, the main theorem. So you have 100% has a, prin has a principle for these satellite equations. So just very quickly to close, let me summarize uh, today's talk. So the first thing I, I'd like to say is that the second moment method, uh, you, uh, there's a new tool you can use. Um, the, this result we have with Johnny and team about uh, arithmetic functions with zero average. And the second point is that to use this tool, it's complicated. You have to use it by choosing some smart model like the Kramer Granville model, for example, or maybe some other additive model in other problems. Um, and, and the last step is that the main theorem is that the Hatze principle for integer points holds for 100% uh, of these satellite equations. Uh, yeah, and that, that's all I have to say. <laughs>